Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to the broadcast ministry of Return to the Word with Pastor Mark Fontecchio, advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now, here is pastor and author Mark Fontecchio. This morning in Revelation chapter 11, we have one of the most difficult sections of the book, but it is a gripping text, a very fascinating text with much to cover in a short time. Last year in 2019, Shea Bradley of Dublin, Ireland, he passed away at age 62. I love this guy. He's got my sense of humor. When his coffin was being lowered into the ground in the cemetery, it was a traditional Irish funeral. They had the bagpipes and all that kind of stuff going on. But then the friends and family gathered around the grave. They heard another sound coming from the bottom of this hole. You see, a a shout rang out from inside the coffin. Hello? 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 Let me out! Yelled Shay from inside the box. And then came the knocking. Where am I? He yelled. Let me out. It's dark in here. Well, his loved ones gathered around the hole in the ground and they were still sitting there in shock. They didn't know what was happening. And then their tears and their sniffles began giving way to giggles. This is Shay. I'm in the box. No, I'm in front of you and I am dead. And then his voice launched into a song, and I won't sing it for you. But he just started singing, I just called to say goodbye, was the song, as the mourners were treated to one last laugh. You see, this was Shay's dying wish, and I love the humor. Because when Shay had gotten the news of his terminal illness a year before, he made secret arrangements secret arrangements with his children to make and play this recording from his casket. Well, this morning in Revelation chapter 11, we have the real deal. Not a recording from a casket, but the death of the two witnesses with their dead bodies lying in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days until the breath of life enters them and they stand up on their feet. This is an amazing passage, and it is a text. It is a text that can teach us how to live now. It has real-world application to how we live here and now. Because we can look at how God's people will handle all that they're going to face in the tribulation, and we can learn how to handle the tough times and the trials of life right here, right now, today. Because in times of tribulation, the lesson is worship God and be a witness for Jesus Christ. Amen? In times of trouble, worship God and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn this from the text as we move forward. Now, if you were with us last week, if you remember from last week, chapter 10 brought us a pause in the judgments of God. There's a little bit of a pause taking place. And the scene in our text today is now on earth. It is during the tribulation focused squarely on the promised land. And the opening scene of chapter 11 is on the two witnesses of God chosen by him to prophesy in Jerusalem. So we start this morning with verse 1 where it says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the outer court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now these verses, these verses here in Revelation 11, they're starting to set the context of everything that's about to follow. Someone, probably an angel, handed John a measuring rod, much like a yardstick. Then John was told to measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. I want you to consider Something. John had this vision around 95 or 96 AD. He'd been living in a cave in the island of Patmos for months, but still he would have known. He knew that the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans about 25 years before this. John's told to measure the temple. He's told to measure the temple. And I wonder if he thought to himself, temple, what temple? What are we talking about? 
But John knew something else. See, John knew the scripture, didn't he? So he knew the Old Testament prophecies. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the prophecies of Christ. He knew the prophecies of Paul that all point to a future tribulation that will stand. Absolutely, there will be a tribulation temple that will stand. Daniel 9.27, Daniel 12.11. They both talk of the daily sacrifice in the temple being taken away half of the way through the tribulation. And our Savior also mentioned this, didn't he? In Matthew 24, he quoted Daniel when he said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, temple, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When Jesus says flee to the mountains, you might want to flee to the mountains. An obvious reference here to the future temple in the tribulation an abomination of desolation being set up in the holy place. Paul was a little more detailed in his writings, wasn't he? Paul tells us more when he described the Antichrist. He said this. He said, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposed and exalts himself above all that is called God, that is worshipped, so that he sits as God where? in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So this temple in Revelation chapter 11, it is the temple that will stand during the tribulation. And the Hebrew people will be able to worship God in their temple in the first half of the tribulation. But at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist, the Antichrist will demand to be worshipped. And John was told something very important here. He was told not to measure the outer court, the outer court of the Gentiles. Now this outer court was the closest that any Gentile could get to the temple. If you went closer, what would happen? The sentence was death. John was only to take note of those who worshipped on the inside of this outer court of the Gentiles. It is only but a remnant here of the world alive at that time worshipping in the temple. But I want you to go back to verse 2 for a second. God has put a limit on the amount of time when the nations will be permitted to tread underfoot the holy city. Luke 21, 24 says this. It says, Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles fulfilled is the second coming of Christ. It's the end of the tribulation. So the 42 months here, the 42 months in Revelation are the second half of the tribulation when the future Antichrist and his false prophet will reign. Not so hard to figure out if you just take the word of God at face value and let it speak for itself. But the question I have for you is this. So what? Why is this here and why does this matter? Well, let's go back to verse 1 for a second. John was told, rise and measure the temple of God. Now it's an expression of ownership here. God is evaluating his property. See, this temple will be built under the protection of the Antichrist, but God is setting the record straight here. God is putting down a permanent marker. He's saying, not only do I own this city, but I own this temple. What do you do when you buy a house? I know what I do. I know what I do here. You measure it. You measure things. When we came out to the valley, we measured our rooms to figure out where we're going to put our stuff. Then we had our land surveyed because my neighbor thought he owned half my yard. When you measure something, it's an expression of ownership. You're evaluating your property. And that's what God is doing here. Even the Hebrew people who will worship him, they belong to God. They are the ones that God will claim as his very own, even during the tribulation. Even then, in the tribulation, the right path is to worship God. Even when you're having a bad day, try it. Worship God. If you're having a terrible day, try it. I dare you. Worship God. 
Instead of running to a therapist, run to God. Instead of running to alcohol, run to God. Instead of running to sex or pornography, run to God. Do you hear it? Instead of running to buying things and shopping and wasting your money, run to God. Instead of running towards your sin nature, run to God. Run to God, worship Him, give Him praise. It's not that hard. Sit down and pray. Put on some Christian music and start worshiping your Creator. People who learn this simple principle, they have steady lives in Christ. I've noticed this over the years. Not lives without problems, but steady lives. Less drama, less drama going on constantly. Because their focus is not on their problems. Their focus is on Jesus Christ. Worship Him. Praise the Lord. Even in the midst of your problems, even in the midst of your pain. This is what God's people will do during the tribulation. They're in the temple worshiping the true and living God. Even though the rest of the world will be following the Antichrist at this time. So worship God. Yes, worship God, even when you don't understand why God is allowing you to go through those difficult times. Focus on the who instead of the reason why. Focus on the who instead of why. Look beyond your circumstances to Jesus and then choose as a believer in Christ to be a witness for Christ. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christians. Let others know about your Savior. Amen? During the tribulation, God is going to raise up two special witnesses. Verse 3 says this. It says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, if this is the angel still speaking here in verse 3, he's speaking on behalf of God. Otherwise, this is God himself speaking. So the first question here is when does this take place? Some take this to mean as happening in the first part of the tribulation. I disagree because the context, I believe, tells us otherwise. I think the end of verse 3 tells us 1,260 days. The same as verse 2, which is 42 months, the great tribulation at the end. The second half of the tribulation, when the holy city is tread underfoot by the Gentiles. Israel will be given relative peace in the first half of the tribulation. The first half's not going to be too bad for Israel then. But then the Gentiles will once again take over the city of Jerusalem, and the Antichrist, he will use the temple of the Jews to receive the worship that belongs to God and God alone. And it is during this dark time of the second half of the tribulation that these two men, these two men will pour out divine judgments from God's wrath on earth to the point that they're going to need their own protection from God. Otherwise, they would be killed. The focus of John's vision in this chapter is of the great tribulation, the last half of the tribulation. God's going to raise up these two men. They will prophesy. They will proclaim his word for 1,260 days. There's a message of judgment coming with them. That's why there's sackcloth, clothes that you wear when you're mourning. But who are these two witnesses? Well, that's a great conversation, isn't it? Now, many, many think of Moses and Elijah because both men were prophets and both men performed miracles by the power of God. Some of the same types of miracles that we see here. Some think this is going to be Enoch and Elijah, since these two men were taken by God to heaven without dying. Wouldn't that be nice? Glory to God, that'd be awesome, taken to heaven without dying. And they think this because of Malachi 4, 5, which says, Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, if you're starting to fall asleep, you need to pay attention, because I'm going to go a little deep, and you've got to follow me with this. Because it was... This prophecy here, and because it was Elijah and Moses that were involved in the transfiguration of Christ in Matthew 17. Do you remember what the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew? It says this, and his disciples asked him, saying, why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has what? Come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer 
at their hands. Jesus told them that Elijah had come. So who's he talking about? Who's he talking about? He's referring to John the Baptist. When it was first announced to his father Zechariah that John would be born, he was told this about John in Luke 1.17, where it says he will also go before him in the spirit and power. Key phrase right there. Before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make a ready people prepared for the Lord. Jesus even said this in Matthew eleven fourteen about John. And if you're willing to receive it, he phrased there too. If you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. See, John came in the spirit and power of Elijah and would have been the fulfillment of Malachi 4 if the people would have received his message. So the bottom line in Revelation 11 is that God does not tell us who these two witnesses are. It doesn't say it's Moses, it's Elijah. It doesn't tell us that. And I think we're pressing the text a little bit more than what it's meant to tell us when we try to label these witnesses as Moses, Elijah, or Enoch and Elijah. And I do not, my opinion, believe the scripture teaches that the two witnesses of Revelation will be these men from the Old Testament. But instead, the teaching is that these will be two men who God will raise up in the spirit and power of these Old Testament men. They will be similar to them, ministering to the nation of Israel. But similarity does not mean identity. Similarity does not mean identity. But we do learn more about them. Let's pick it up with verse 4. It says, these are the two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, look at this part, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner, must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy and they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all the plagues as often as they desire. Now this is, again, similar but not identical to the text of Zechariah 4. This might be a reference to Zechariah 4 where the people, if you remember from that text, they had come back into the land after being exiled to Babylon. It's about 500 years before the ministry of Christ. And in that text of Zechariah 4, Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor sought to restore the nation of Israel. In Zechariah 4, there's only one lampstand and two olive trees mentioned. And the point of comparison that we are supposed to grasp and understand is the word of the Lord given to Zerubbabel where it says this, not by might nor by power, but by what? My spirit, says the Lord of hosts. See, the olive oil from the olive trees provided the oil for the lampstand. The olive oil represented the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And just as these two witnesses were raised up for the nation of Israel and empowered by the Spirit of God, so will the two witnesses of Revelation 11 be empowered by God. Empowered by God, they're going to be witnesses on earth. See, the greatest witnesses for Jesus Christ are not the people who sit there and rely on their own abilities, their own memories, their own strengths, their own qualities in life, their own abilities to argue, their own abilities to debate, but those who simply rely on Jesus Christ, on God to work in them. Look at how God is going to protect these men. Anyone attempts to hurt them will be killed by fire coming out of their mouths. I want in on that action. That would be so cool. Sorry, I freaked some of you out with that. It would be cool. Talk about preaching fire and damnation. Now that is a sermon there. This is God protecting them. Let's talk about what this is. This is God protecting them. And this is also God using these two guys to judge mankind. No one can lay a hand on them. That's the idea here. Now, it should make you, let's be serious about what this fire is. It should make you think of 2 Kings chapter 1, when Elijah called down fire from heaven on the soldiers that were sent to arrest him. And that might be the idea here, calling down fire from heaven with their words. 
Numbers 16 gives us the enemies of Moses being destroyed with fire from the Lord. And just like Elijah, these two witnesses will have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. You know, when Elijah prayed, it did not rain for three and a half years, which will be the same thing in Revelation 11. Like Moses, they will have power power to turn water into blood and to strike the earth with plagues. It says what? As often as they desire. They will have the greatest combination of powers ever given to God's prophets on earth. That's an amazing thing, which tells us how they're going to withstand their enemies for the second half of the tribulation. But at the end of their great tribulation, when their ministry is finished, their enemies are going to be allowed to have the upper hand for a moment in time. And even this is allowed for by a sovereign appointment of God. Satan will be ruling through the Antichrist at that time. The demons of Satan are going to be running free, killing people on the earth. It's a terrible time. But two men, two men by themselves, standing alone and empowered by God in heaven will be a threat to satanic kingdom. This will be the fifth period in history when God will enable a few people to do these types of signs and wonders. See, this is a key teaching in scripture. I don't want you to think, I don't want you to think that God's always doing these signs and wonders every single day. I mean, he does miracles. I think my life is a miracle. But this is the fifth period in history. Let's review for a second. The first four periods were the times of Moses and Joshua, then Elijah and Elisha, then Daniel and his three friends, and then the time of Christ's earthly ministry and that of his apostles. You see, each time in the Bible that God has worked like this in the lives of a few individuals, it is because there's been a major shift in what God is doing on earth. The giving of the law, with Moses, the eve of the judgment of Israel, Elijah and Elisha, Israel in captivity and God preserving them, Daniel, right? The birth of the church, the apostles of Jesus Christ. And here in Revelation 11, a big shift. It's the two witnesses. And these are the judgments leading to the second coming of Christ and his kingdom. Pick it up with verse seven. It says, when they Finish their testimony. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the people, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. There's an old, old story, a great old story of a crowded crowded theater, not a movie theater, an old school theater where the people had gathered for all these different things. They'd come to see a show with different acts and performances. And each act was more fantastic than the one before. So it created in this theater this loud thunder and applause from the audience. And suddenly this clown rushed onto the stage and said, I apologize, I'm sorry for the interruption, but I regret to inform you that our theater is on fire. You need to leave right away. The audience thought he was part of the act. So what did they do? They laughed and they applauded. The people thought he was very committed to his performance the longer this went on. So again, the clown, he pleaded with them that they needed to leave right away. They could die by fire if they just stayed there, if they just stayed put. Once more, the audience laughed. They applauded, still thinking he was all part of this act. Realizing he could do no more, he left the building and the people were destroyed. It has been rightly said that our age The age we live in right now is going to go down in fiery destruction, not to the sound of mourning, but to the applause and cheering of men. That's true. And it's going to be the same thing in the tribulation. See, verse 7 of the text starts to describe this, speaking of the two witnesses. And notice how the verse starts out. When they finish their testimony. Circle that. When they finish their testimony. There's a completion there. When they finish their testimony, not when part of the job is done, 
Not when it took God off guard. When they finish their testimony. When they finish their testimony, not a second before, not two seconds before, God will permit the beast to kill the two witnesses. They're going to have survived a lot. They're going to have survived the second half of the tribulation. Satan's going to be throwing his best at them, the best he can, and he will be unable to touch them until who permits? God. But when God permits, these, these two end time prophets will die. They will frustrate their enemies. They'll be unstoppable for the duration of the ministries that God has given to them. So take some confidence, Christians. God will not allow his people to die until he's done with them on earth. I don't understand why people are so scared of death. You're going to die someday. Get used to that idea. You're going to die, but it's in God's hands. When God says, mission accomplished, he's going to lift his hand of protection from there and their enemies will be permitted to kill them. They will be put to death in the same city where Jesus was put to death. Therefore, what does this teach us? We're trying to understand the Bible. This must be a reference to Jerusalem. It's described as Sodom. Described as Sodom because of the perversion of man. Described as Egypt because of the pride, idolatry, and bondage of man. You know, Scripture says this about Sodom in Genesis 13, 13. And I want you to think about this verse when you think about some of the garbage and the homosexuality and the perversion that you're letting into your homes through the TV. It says, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. That stuff is sick. Don't allow it into your home. The people of Jerusalem at this time will be depraved. They'll be wicked. They'll be antagonistic toward God. And this is the first time. This is the first time we're introduced to the beast in the book of Revelation. This is the Antichrist. And this will become clear as we work through Revelation. Now it says his origin is the bottomless pit, the abode of the demons. He's empowered by Satan. He'll be responsible for killing the two witnesses. But the contempt for these men, the contempt for Christ will be on display. The people, they'll leave their dead bodies in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. That's a horrible thing. This is an affront to their entire culture, which demands, it demands a quick burial. In verse 9, it tells us that the peoples, the tribes, the tongues, and the nations will see their dead bodies and not allow their bodies to be put into the graves. The people of the world will see their dead bodies made possible now through satellites and through the Internet. But the reference may just be simply this to the people from all these groups in Jerusalem at this time. But you know what? Just like that audience, just like that audience laughing and clapping in a theater, even in the face of their own destruction, those who dwell on the whole earth will rejoice. They're going to rejoice at the news of these two men's death. One day, the whole world's going to turn on their smartphones and their little devices, their electronic devices, and see these two witnesses dead in the street, and they're going to celebrate for three and a half days. Why? Because that's how depraved they are. And they are going to celebrate because it's a symbol of victory for the beast and for those who oppose God, for those who hate God. They will take it as proof that they no longer have to fear the wrath and the power of God. And the ministry of these two witnesses will be a thorn in the side of the world rulers of the tribulation. Their death is going to be seen as silencing of those of the prophets who announce the judgment of a world that does not believe in God. And given that this is towards the end of the Great Tribulation, and not that many days after this, Christ will come back in power and great glory. People of the world will send gifts to one another because they'll hate these men of God and will rejoice at their death. We see some of this type of hatred today in the world for the people of Jesus Christ. This is the only time, note this, this is the only time of rejoicing during the tribulation recorded in Revelation where the people will celebrate. Because just like a lost person who comes to church and doesn't want to listen to the word of God being taught, and that's why they don't belong, the world will celebrate because they don't have to listen to messages from God anymore. They're going to celebrate. But the people of the world have a surprise coming, don't they? Let's read verse 11. Our text tells us in verse 11, Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. 
And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. These dead bodies will be lying on the street in Jerusalem for all to see, but then God is going to step in. God is going to step in and raise them to life after three and a half days. Those people who celebrated the death of these witnesses for Christ will now are going to look in fear. They're going to look on in fear because the breath of life from God will enter the witnesses of God. They're going to leap up to their feet and ascend to heaven in the sight of all when the voice of heaven calls them home. Because God, God does not abandon his people. He will call his people home. Great fear, great fear. It doesn't say great faith. It says great fear will fall upon the people because they thought death would be the end of it. There was nothing else they could do to these two men. What do you do when you have an enemy that you kill? There's nothing else you can do when they come back to life. With the world still gawking, with the world still looking up, the city of Jerusalem will shake with a great earthquake. It will happen the same hour, the text tells us. And one-tenth of the city will collapse and leave 7,000 from the city of Jerusalem dead, with the rest afraid, giving glory to God in heaven. The second woe was announced back in chapter 8, and it has come to pass. Second woe is trumpet judgment number 6. And the final judgments are about to fall, continued in the final trumpet judgment. Tilly Smith and her family were relaxing on the beach during a family vacation. Tilly was only 10 years old. And that morning, Tilly and her parents, along with her sister Holly, went for a walk on the beach. And you know how it is when you're on the beach. It's glorious. It's a great thing being on the beach when it's a nice day. It's just awesome. The warm breeze on your face, the sand is kind of squishing before your toes, and you're running to catch the waves. It's a great thing. Well, young Tilly, she noticed something on that day because two weeks before this, she'd been in school learning about tsunamis in geography class. Geography class can be boring. Sure can. Well, Tilly didn't like her geography class, and her teacher showed a video, though, that caught her attention. It got her attention. So as Tilly and her family were walking along on this beach, she noticed the waves were going in the wrong direction. They were going out, but they were not coming in. So she told her parents right away that they were surrounded by dangerous signs, very unusual signs, signs that were saying something unusual and devastating was about to happen. And her parents didn't listen because we're parents and we don't listen to our kids always, right? But Tilly's passion and persistence paid off. Left with no other options, and left with the confidence in the truth of the danger before them, she began shouting. She's 10. She began shouting, there's going to be a tsunami, because she believed it. Well, Tilly started shouting louder and louder. It started to frighten people, scaring people on the beach, scaring her younger sister, who began to cry, cry uncontrollably. And because she was crying, Tilly's dad took Holly back to the hotel to calm, calm her down, the younger sister. But Tilly looked around and she wasn't satisfied because she could still see people in the ocean. She could still see people on the beach, on the sand. And she just knew in her heart that everyone there was in danger. So Tilly ran back to the hotel to find her dad talking with a security guard. And here's what she found him saying to the security guard. I know this sounds completely mad, but my daughter says there's going to be a tsunami. And so this security guard decided to listen, not to a weather expert, you never want to listen to them, but to a passionate plea from a 10-year-old schoolgirl. He shouted for people running up on that beach, up and down on that beach, shouting for people to get off the beach, and people scattered all over the place as pandemonium set in. Now the hotel lobby up on a higher floor became a gathering place. And so when that tsunami in 2004 hit that I told you guys about a few weeks ago, 
triggered by an earthquake on the floor of the Indian Ocean. It hit Thailand, where Tilly and her family were staying, waves up to 100 feet tall. It ended up killing, as we said, more than 230,000 people. But not one person from Tilly's Beach died. Tilly's dad, in complete shock, after learning of the horrific devastation and suffering, said to Tilly, what if I hadn't listened to you? What if I hadn't listened? I tell you this because as Christians, you need to know this right now. You need a reminder to be aware of the times which we're living. You need to pay attention. Don't ignore the warnings of God of his judgment yet to come. The signs of the times should be very, very clear to the believer in Jesus Christ who cares enough about God's word to open it up and read it. The stage is set for the end time events like the Bible describes it. Israel is in the land, controls the city of Jerusalem. Preparations are being made now for the third temple. The nations are aligned as the Bible predicts. And we do not know the Lord's time. And we don't know if it's today, a thousand years from now. But we can see that the stage is set for the day of the Lord. Oh, we can see it. And if you have read your Bible, you should be well aware of the wave of judgment that is coming. I don't know who said it first. Someone said that if you're doing what God has called you to do, you are indestructible until you finish your work. Let me say it again. If you're doing what God has called you to do, you're indestructible until you finish his work. See, I, I believe in the strengthening power of God in my life. I believe there's no accidents with God. I believe that my life, my ministry, and my death, yes, even my death, are in his hands. I believe he has a work for me to do on this earth and that I am doing the work that he has called me to. He will continue to strengthen. He's going to continue to protect until my work is finished and he takes me home. Isn't this what Paul said, something similar in Philippians 1, 6, where he said, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. See, being a witness for Christ means you will be used by God to do his work and complete his purpose for you until your time, until your time is complete. Then the war with death and darkness will end, and he's going to usher you into glory. These two witnesses in Revelation have a remarkable calling. They do. And yet their experience is simply a reflection of what each of us as believers in Christ is called to. Your life will be absolutely different from theirs. Your journey will be different than mine. We're not going to call down fire from heaven or shut up the sky so the rain doesn't fall. But God, God empowers just the same, doesn't he? God will empower us and protect us until our work is done. God wants each of his own to experience his word, his work, and his will for our lives. Your life may not be like the storybooks with the Hallmark Channel or fairy tale endings. Not everybody gets to just fall in love and go off into the sunset, right? And in the end, it may even seem in your life that the bad guys have won. But yet, from a heavenly perspective, think on that. The end of the story is like the story of Jesus. Because he seemed defeated. He was crucified. He was nailed to that cross. And they laid him in the ground. But that was just the beginning of the victory. Praise be to God. So when our death comes, we can know that death means being reunited with Christ. And we can look forward to a resurrection of our own. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God in the dead in Christ will rise first. I'm saying this to you, Christians. If you believe it, if you believe it, you should want to tell others. If you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you really should want to tell others. So be a bold witness for Christ. If you're not a bold witness for Christ, ask God to give you a bold witness for him. A passion like young Tilly had on that beach. Why? Because she believed it. See, even when the persecution and the troubles come, don't be afraid. 
Do not be afraid of this world. Do not be afraid to tell others of Jesus Christ. Because God is in the business of turning tragic situations in life into lives that glorify him and honor him. So worship him. No matter what, worship him every day of the week. Don't wait for Sunday. Don't come to church once a month and think you did your duty for God. Worship the creator. Witness for the creator. And then by the grace of God, use your pain. Use your troubles for His glory. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening. And we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.